Welcome back everybody to the Cocos Lectures. Uh, today we're going to talk about Cocos tools and how they help you understanding what's going on in your codes, uh, how they help you debugging your codes, and how they help you improve performance in the long run. So, as always, you know, there's all the resources. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have the uh, Cocos Lecture Series uh, wiki updated in a second so that you can download the slides for yourself. Uh, there's also the, uh, on here the Cocos Tools wiki, which has uh, the explanation and the, uh, you know, the documentation for the tools. So, uh, and as always, you know, join our Slack channel, ask us questions if you have questions, you know, in particular also with the tools, uh, we can help there and we have the people there who know how this stuff works. So we've come a long way in our lecture series. We've talked about all the programming aspects, actually. We talked about, you know, all the curl dispatches. We talked about how to uh, manage memory and how to manage heterogeneous architectures. We talked about all these data structures and multidimensional loops and uh, how you get more parallelism out of your uh, life, you know, with hierarchical parallelism. We talked about tasking, we talked about uh, streams and uh, symbolization of your code. And last week we talked about uh, multiple things. We talked about the uh, language interoperability with Python and Fortran, and we also talked about the internode uh, communication via MPI and PGAS. Uh, and if we look a bit back at that, uh, you know, we hopefully got away from that, that uh, simple MPI is relatively easy. You know, you just pass the data pointers over to your uh, MPI functions and, uh, you know, then it basically works. And we also talked about overlapping communication and computation using the correct, like, execution space instances, essentially combining it with the things we learned about streams the week before that. Uh, and we're actually going to look at that in, in just a minute and go into uh, do the MPI exercises for this thing. So we're going to do a walkthrough through that. Uh, we also looked at Fortran and Python interoperability and in particular how we allow, we enable you via these extra libraries to initialize and finalize Cocos from Fortran and uh, Python respectively uh, and how you can alias like the native array types in these two languages with Cocos views on the C++ side. Uh, in particular for the Python interop, this is still in pre-release, so ask us for access on the, uh, on the Slack channel and we can uh, get you there. Okay, so before we get into the tool section today, I want to actually walk you through uh, the MPI exercises and show you, you know, how it works. So, um, I'm here in the MPI pack unpack uh, exercise, in the begin exercise, and uh, let's dive into that. So, what does this code actually do? It actually instantiates a simple pack unpack uh, kind of benchmark uh, in different combinations. And the first one is where's your, you know, the, if you look at these instances here, um, the first one is actually where is my, uh, where's my data living? And the second one is what is the pack buffer? And we essentially do here different variants, you know, where we pack into CUDA space or CUDA host pin space or CUDA UVM space, if we build for CUDA, that is, right? Uh, which we will do in this case. So let's see what we need to do. There's actually not too much to do. And unfortunately, I just noticed that uh, uh, exercise comments are somewhat missing here, uh, or at least not marked properly. Uh, but the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out, you know, what is our, uh, our data pointers we need to give to MPI. And uh, as I said, we can just use the data dot data function on views. And we see up here, you know, in the, in the constructor of this test, that uh, you know, we have here we send buffers and receive buffers. So let's just use those. So we'll get the pointer for MPI from the receive buffer and from the uh, send buffer. Now we need to post the receives as well, uh, you know, the I receives. Uh, for that, we first need an MPI request handle. Uh, we're actually gonna need two of those. Uh, 
because we need uh, one for the for the iSense later. So let's start with an iReceive. Uh, we'll just hand it the receive buff pointer. We also need to give it the length, and the length we can actually get from uh, you know either the list extent or actually also from the uh, from the uh, from a buffer extent, right? So let's take that from the buffer. This is how many elements are in there. Uh, and then we need to tell it what kind of type it is. We see that the buffers here are both doubles up here. So we'll just use MPI double for the type. Uh, we need to give it to a partner uh, to, to, you know, who's the, the other guy in the communication pattern. And we see that we have here me and partner is the two, uh, the two kind of MPI ranks, right? And uh, it just sets to the other one, right? So we just need to communicate with our partner here. This test is really just set up for two MPI ranks. When we use the MPI com world to uh, you know, tell it what communicator to use, uh, this is generally not re recommended, right? Generally, the recommendation is to not use MPI com world, but uh, actually create your own communicators. But since this is a very simple benchmark, you know, we'll uh, ignore that uh, you know, best practice. OK, and then last but not least, we have to give it a pointer to the MPI request. Okay, now the packing happens and then we need to send the data and we'll ignore the, the option, you know, which the actual solution of this has where it also can uh, optionally, depending on whether the, uh, yeah, this use device buffer thing is set, uh, where it then deep copies to the host, but we'll ignore that and just do the direct device to device communication. So what do we need to do for the send? First, we need to make sure that, uh, the packing is actually done, right? Otherwise, the MPI, in particular, if it uses like RDMA options, right, will just start, uh, you know, just start uh, copying things before it's actually done. Then we can post the MPI I sent here. Uh, also use the send, doesn't really matter. Uh, we need to give it the send buffer. Uh, we get, give it the send buffer dot extent here. We give it again MPI double and partner and the MPI com world. And we have a request. Wait. And then we can really wait for all of these guys to be done. MPI. So it needs two, it gets the requests and it gets, uh, we don't need the status or we don't check the statuses here. Again, you know, something you in a real code probably should better do, but we're just gonna ignore it. Okay, and that's actually it. So with that, we should be able to compile this guy. Oh, one thing, I'm using uh, OpenMPI here. So we set OMPI CXX to uh, the Cocos NVCC wrapper. So now we are building this for CUDA and I did something wrong. Uh, what did I do wrong? In 102, receive buffer. I forgot an argument after partner, I think, or double. Oh, right, there is a, there's the tag missing in both of these cases, the MPI tags. So we'll uh, just going to use the one and one here for the tag matching. that worked. Let's see if that actually works. Uh, we'll tell it here that we want to use two devices. And when we run this, we get data. Yay. And actually it's kind of like what we saw in the data we presented last week. You know, we, the, if we directly communicate from like the CUDA buffers, it's actually slower when communicating from host buffers in this case. And uh, and interestingly enough, also when communicating from 
uh, UVM buffers. Part of it might be just that I have a bad setup. You know, I don't actually have an InfiniBand thing in here, so it, uh, that's what this weird error message is. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but um, yeah, this works. Good. So that's simple MPI. Now uh, we're going to go to a little bit more complex uh, thing, and that was the heat conduction example. And what we need to do in this guy is we actually need to do a little bit more complex things. In particular, we are trying to use all the different uh, uh, nah, execution space instances to make sure you know, that we uh, get proper overlapping of the, uh, of the communication with the, uh, with the uh, computation. Okay, so let's dive into this one. I think this one actually has proper markup. Yes. So, but let's let's look at some a couple of things first. So, I said we need to use the right execution space instances. The exercise is actually already set up to have those, right? So there is, if you look here, we already have all these exercise uh, execution space instances defined. There is actually one uh, matching everyone every one of the communication directions, right? So as I have the buffers, the in and out buffers for you know, left, right, up, down, front, back. I also have execution spaces for that. And I have a bulk execution space for uh, doing computation, you know, independently of all the packing and unpacking for the, for the elements which are just part of the, uh, of the bulk of this uh, black body. Okay, so first thing, in the, in the begin state here, we have an exchange halo which does both things, right? It actually packs buffers and then it sends them with MPI. Uh, and and so we don't really uh, uh, we don't really need to do that here, right? We need to split it off into two different parts. So let's actually do that. So we're going to create that function later. So we'll use the pack here, and then the question is now how where should we actually uh, do this. And the, the point is that we need to do this after the compute inner, right? So what we want to do is we start the pack buffers because all these pack buffers are relatively small and we don't hog the whole GPU. Then we start the compute inner, uh, you know, the bulk uh, compute. And uh, that way the bulk compute can just use whatever is left of the GPU resources after all the pack buffers are launched, right? And then we start the MPI communication then we can compute the surface, uh, you know, elements, and then uh, we can wait and compute t. Okay, so let's go there. So first of all, this is the compute inner, right? So this is the bulk execution. So what we need to do is we need to tell it here to actually use the bulk execution space instance. So we'll just give it as a first argument to the policy. Okay, now let's look at the next one. So this is where we need to split the exchange halo, right? And the exchange halo right now does two, both things, it deep copies and it then does the I send and I receive. So uh, in order to split that, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna copy the whole freaking thing uh, and insert it again. Flip. And just rename the first version of that to pack. So in the pack, what we can do is we can simply delete all the uh, communication routines. Uh, and then we need to do another thing. As I said, we need to use the uh, execution space instances. And since we named them all consistently, right, we just look at what the, what the names are and stick them in here. Front. E right. So what you see is, you know, it's it's a bit tedious to do some of the stuff, but on the other hand, you know, uh, in compared to debugging a non-working code yet, you know, or new code, it's probably not that bad. Okay, so now in the second version, uh, in the exchange, we need to we can delete the the deep copies because those were already underway. 
But we need to do one more thing. We need to actually make sure that the deep copies we issued in the previous, in the pack call, uh, are actually done, right? Because these are all happening asynchronously in that particular execution space stream. So we need to fence these streams. Them. Okay, so now we just need to make them that they are actually fencing the correct one. So this one is back, up, right, front, right, down. Okay, now we have these guys fenced. Great. Uh, now, what else is missing, right? We need to, for the surface stuff, we can again push the different uh, kernels into different streams so that we overlap with each other. So we just need to add as an argument to the policies, the correct uh, ones. So this is left, the right, the down, up, the front, and the back. And with that, I think we should be almost done. Uh, it says here, wait for completion. So we are supposed to wait for all the uh, kernels to be done. We can do that here and when we're good. Okay, so let's see how this works. If we do this guy now, exchange t pack is, oh my goodness, what did I do? Uh, 256, yeah, I think we named it pack t halo. See, now we can run this guy. Again, we tell it to use two GPUs. And we're getting here some performance. Uh, what we can do is we can check what would actually have happened if we hadn't done this. Uh, actually, let me try one more thing. In this case, because we're sending many buffers, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and if we stash all our changes here, let's do that. Uh, rebuild this guy. And run this again. Hopefully that second time is now slower. Yeah, it is. So you see that second time here uh, is, the, is the kind of time per time step or per hundred time steps or something. Uh, so that's what we gained by this uh, overlapping change. In this case, you know, uh, I probably could find better uh, parameters to find, you know, a bit more gain here, but uh, that's not the point of the exercise. Okay, so what I showed you here is that we can use the, uh, the execution space instances, you know, to uh, sort this all kind of properly out and then get overlapping of things and gain some performance from it. Uh, you know, it's probably not the first thing you're gonna look at, but at some point, you know, when you actually start optimizing fully, uh, it's something, you know, to think about. Okay, with that, let's come back to our tutorial today. So, today we're gonna dive into Coco's tools. And uh, in particular, we're gonna look into, uh, into the, you know, the the simple tools usage. So we'll look at some of the, you know, pretty 
simple tools which work just across all the different uh, platforms. So we'll talk about how to you know, dynamically load Cocos tools, how to do some print simple profiling and debugging of them. We're also gonna talk about uh, leveraging the Cocos P instrumentation for third party tools. So how you use our instrumentation to connect to things like, uh, uh, like Endside Systems and NVProf and, and uh, VTune and stuff like that. Uh, we're gonna talk about Cocos tuning then uh, you know, give you a little bit of an introduction into how to auto-tune parameters uh, and, uh, you know, where this is going. This was actually just released this week as part of the Cocos 3.2 release. So it's, you know, pretty brand new, but it's actually a really cool feature. Uh, and when we're going to talk about uh, how you build your own tools and why that actually might be, you know, more useful than you may think. And last but not least, we're going to talk a bit about static analysis and how the new Cocos LLVM tools, uh, you know, can help you do uh, catch errors, you know, which are otherwise maybe hard to catch, uh, uh, you know, on its own. Okay, let's start with some basic Cocos tools. So we'll talk a bit about, you know, why do we need these tools? Uh, we'll talk about how instrumentation helps with, uh, you know, certain situations. And uh, then we'll talk a bit about simple profiling and simple debugging tools. Uh, so this is an output from NVIDIA NVProf for, for when you run like Trillinos, a simple like T-Petra solver. And you know, the point is not that you really see what is going on here. The point is that you see it's all jumbled and there's, uh, you know, it's really hard to identify what the heck is going on here. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, we have at some point, I think the worst thing I have ever seen is uh, NVProf reporting a kernel where the kernel name as of a global function name was something on the order of 4,000 characters in Trillinos, right? And it's really hard to identify what the heck is going on here. Uh, and the problem is that essentially generic code obscures what is happening, uh, you know, from tools. And Part of the reason is that historically a lot of these tools are coming from a Fortran and C world, right? So we are really focused on like functions and, and variables. You think about things like NVProf, right? It expects you to have like simple, clear global function names for your functions in CUDA, right? And then it's relatively easy to identify what this function does. But in C++, we also have a lot of other things going on, right? We have classes, we have inheritance, we have template meta programming. And if we use all of these things in abstraction models or generic programming, it leads to, uh, you know, uh, things really being obscured for the, uh, for compilers. So one of the things here, uh, one of the problems, for example, is that if you run like, uh, like host profilers, uh, a lot of the interesting stuff happens in the abstraction layer, like Pragma OMP Perl, right? Pragma OMP Perl in Cocos only happens in like three or four places, right? So what your profiler will think is, oh, you have really nice hotspots in Cocos OMP Perl. That is nice to know, right? But it doesn't really help you understand where your hotspots are from your perspective, right? Uh, and then the symbol names get really complex due to deep template layers, right? Like in, like in Cocos, there is actually only three global functions, right? In the entirety of Cocos, right? In the entirety of, of, a, of a Trillinos build, right? I don't know, one million lines of C++, right? There's exactly three places where it says global, right? For if you build for CUDA. And these three places are in the Cocos abstraction layer. The different functions come in because all these global functions are templated. They are templated on something like the functor type, uh, uh, the, the execution policy, and some other stuff, right? And so if your functor types then come from classes, which are themselves, for example, templated on, uh, on like Cocos view types, right? These names get really long. Now, there is something which can help with that, and that's instrumentation. And actually, most profiling tools have like an instrumentation interface. For example, you have like NVTX for NVIDIA and ITT for Intel. And what these guys allow you to do is they allow you to do things like name region. Sometimes they also allow you to like mark up memory operations, you know, with explicit instrumentation. 
And what you have to do for that is you have to put explicit calls into your code. But they are different for every single one of these profiling tools, right? or at least for every vendor. And what we came up with is we came up with our own instrumentation interface uh, called Cocos P. And uh, what you can do with that is it, you can write your own tools, you know, uh, targeting that. Uh, what this Cocos P interface it knows is it knows about parallel dispatch, right? So it's, it, it's semantically matching the main operations in Cocos, right? Like parallel fours, parallel uses, and stuff like that. It knows about things like allocations and deallocations and deep copies. Uh, it also provides you region markers. And this interface is the reason that we tell you to name all your kernels and that we force you to name all your views, right? Because the, the internal usage of this instrumentation interface in the Cocos runtime uh, leverages all these names to provide context information to tools. Generally, there are two components to Cocos tools. One is what I just mentioned, the Cocos P instrumentation interface, and then we have the actual tools. So the Cocos P interface, what it does is it gives this internal instrumentation layer of Cocos. One thing about it is it's always enabled, even in your release builds, right? So this thing doesn't go away. And in fact, we had for a while an option to compile it out, but we removed that option uh, recently. So you cannot turn Cocos P interface off, right? But the good thing is it's essentially zero overhead if you do not load a tool. If you do not use a tool, right? A profiling tool or debugging tool or whatever, uh, which leverages Cocos, the Cocos P interface, it has zero overhead. Uh, and then there's the Cocos tools. And the Cocos tools, they leverage that interface. And what you do with them is you load them at runtime. Uh, you can do that for two ways. You can either set Cocos profile library, uh, which is an environment variable, and you point it to a shared library. And what we then do is we use DL open to dynamically load symbols from that, uh, from that library. Or you can compile tools into your executable and use an API, which has like a callback setting mechanism. And we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. So what you do is you download the tools from github.com, you know, Cocos, Cocos tools. All these tools are largely independent of your Cocos configuration. So we don't really need to know whether you compile for CUDA or for OpenMP or whatever. Uh, the only thing is they kind of probably need to use the same C++ standard library or a C library. Uh, so you probably want to compile them with the same compiler. But even there, you know, if it's GNU compatible, uh, all the make files are set up to build with GNU by default, you know, it probably just works. Uh, so it's simple make files. All of these make files are independent of the Cocos config. So these tools are not built against Cocos itself. You just type make, you know, in the specific tool directory of a tool you want to build and, uh, you know, you're good to go. So I said earlier, you can load uh, uh, the, the standard way of using these tools is setting an environment variable. So you set Cocos profile library environment variable, and you set it just to the full path of the shared library of the tool. And what then happens is that we dynamically load symbols from that library during initialize. So when you call Cocos initialize, we check that environment variable. And if we find, uh, uh, if you find it set, we try to dynamically open that uh, library and see if there are symbols in there which match our instrumentation interface, right, with our callback interface. And if so, we uh, get these symbols out and fill function pointers. If you do not load a tool, the overhead of our instrumentation interface is essentially that you have function pointer comparisons to null pointer. And you have these for operations like dispatching a kernel, uh, creating a view, calling a deep copy or something like that, right? And so there's, there's a function pointer comparison at the beginning of the call and at the end of the call. And if that function pointer is null pointer, then nothing happens. And so your overhead is literally two pointer comparisons for every one of these big uh, Cocos operations, right? Considering that dispatching a kernel to a GPU costs you somewhere between three and eight microseconds, you know, comparing two pointers is literally not measurable. Right, as you couldn't tell whether or not we compile this compar comparison in or not. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, most of the examples we show will, will use something like that uh, as a viscode. 
we create like two views here, uh, A and the host based version of that by a create mirror view. Uh, we'll talk about this push region, pop region stuff later, but essentially just like region markers. We run a parallel four to init something on the host, right? So this is running on the, on the host exec. Uh, and then we run an iterate, uh, you know, loop, loop where we do the same parallel scan and parallel reduction operations multiple times with the, with the device kernel. Uh, and we create in that loop some, you know, something which is generally a bad idea. We create a temporary view, which at the end of each iteration goes out of scope, right? So obviously in this toy example, that's kind of silly, but uh, you know, this kind of stuff happens more often than you would think. So if we run with this nvprof, uh, we get an output like that. And again, you know, it's kind of like what we see in, uh, in what we saw in the T Petra example, maybe not quite as bad, but uh, uh, it's you know bad enough. And let me blow up one of these guys. This is the third kernels, the third kernel. And what you see here is uh, nvprof says this is the global function name. Okay. Now the first problem is that apparently for this particular global function, nvprof couldn't figure out how to demangle that thing. Uh, which is funny, right? Because it actually demangled like half of the kernels, but apparently not this one. So I can demangle that, right? And it turns into this. And now, you know, if you're really good in reading like symbol names and you really understand what's going on in Cocos, right? You can actually tell what's going on, right? So I know, oh, it's a parallel reduction. And we actually used the local launch mechanism, which means that we gave the, the functor as a argument to the global function instead of loading it to the constant memory. And oh, your functor, by the way, was a lambda, this is, which is this L here, uh, this L here, uh, in main, and it takes an integer as an argument and the reference to a double. Great. Uh, and you can see that here, right? The lambda in double. Uh, the one here is just the numbering of, you know, the internal numbering of NVCC for creating lambdas. So, you know, if you know that, you know, cool. But on the other hand, you know, this is probably a bit confusing. So this is kind of horrifying, right? Uh, in particular, if you're not somebody who wrote the uh, guts of Kogos. So can we do better? And yes, we can do better. So let's start with something really simple. A real simple tool in Cocos Tools is simple kernel timer. Uh, what it does, it essentially just produces a summary similar to what you get from nvprof when you just run nvprof without arguments. It essentially just lists all the, all the regions and all the, all the kernel names. So it's really a good way of getting a rough overview of what's going on in your application. And what it does with tool is that it, it writes at the end, so when Corpus finalizes getting called, it writes a file out per process. It names these guys as host name minus process ID. So you can use that tool in conjunction with like MPI, for example. And then there's a reader which accompanies the tool uh, to read this data. So uh, I have a simple usage things, right? So I clone Cocos tools. I go in there to the simple kernel timer, I type make. I export Cocos profile library pointing to that uh, .so file. I also export the path so that I can use the KP reader in that thing. I go back to my work directory, uh, run my test code and read the reader. And what I get from that is something like this. And what you see here is it, it marks up the two regions, you know, the iterate and the setup region. It tells you how often, uh, you know, uh, where these guys got inserted. Uh, Actually, uh, it's a bit funny. I did a mistake when I created this. It actually aggregated all the .dat files in my thing, so I had I had like four runs here. Um, and when you see the kernels, right? You see the first kernel at least is Cocos view initialization, and that's actually what happens when you create a view internally. This is the setting everything to zero, but it also tells you the name of the view, a mirror. So a mirror was the host view, right? So this is actually a kernel which runs on the host, and uh, it took relatively long because I was running this in like uh, in like serial or something like that. Uh, then there's the K1 kernel and the K2 kernel, and so on. So that's fine. So we now we get proper names, we get names which actually tell us what we 
uh, do, right? We get both the names of your kernels and we get names for Cocos internal operations like Cocos view initialization, right? So all of these guys are now uh, visible and, you know, in a way that you can actually understand what the heck they are doing. Uh, one other thing it does here is it tells you the total execution time, which is essentially the time between Cocos initialize and Cocos finalize, and how much of that time did you spend inside of kernels? Uh, and how much of outside of the kernels, right? So this is the first kind of gauche of, you know, how good is your code paralyzed, right? Um, generally, one thing about the tools is they currently add fences before and after every parallel operation, because otherwise you would only measure the, the dispatch time and not the actual kernel time, right? So um, that's something to know. But the point is here, kernel naming avoids seeing confusing profile output, right? You see proper names instead of weird stuff. Uh, if we go back to like the simple kernel timer using the Tpetra thing I showed just at the beginning, right? You actually get, uh, you know, these two sections, right? You get the region output because Tpetra adds proper regions. And um, but what you see here is the, the CG stuff is actually in the, in the test code and in in, I was running like a CG software. And you see there's a, you know, the global thing and how much time did I spend in SPMV and XP. And then there's like the, uh, the internal from Cocos kernels regions, right? And it actually tells you, it's, it's interesting, uh, the, the Cocos, it was running here the Cocos Blast XP uh, call. And one thing it tells you here is it did an ETI version of that, right? So it was a thing which was pre-compiled and not partial, you know, instantiated on the fly. It would actually tell you if you were hitting like kublas or kusbars with that call, if you had compiled it. And then the kernels, we see now these different kernels, right? We see here CRS metrics, sort, merge, indices, and values, which is part of like the creation of the metrics. And then you see here the Coco sparse call, SPMV. So that's the sparse map back. And it actually tells you, you know, that it was doing a node transpose and uh, was dynamic execution or dynamic scheduling. Uh, you see the CRS metrics pack and uh, pack values and pack column indices for the MPI communication. You see the XP and you actually see what specialization of the XP it was calling uh, and so on. So this is, you know, much cleaner output, which tells you exactly what's going on. And that's because all of these guys are properly named, right? And in our libraries, we name these things, you know, with, uh, with prefixes, which tell you which part of the library they are coming from. You know, this was coming from Tpetra, this was coming from Cocos kernels, uh, Cocos sparse and Cocos blast and stuff like that. Okay, there's other tools. For example, there's tools which allow you to understand uh, memory utilization which is generally uh, pretty important. So there's three simple tools in the Cocos Tools repository for that. One of them is memory high watermark. You know, if you load that tool, it just will print at the end of your run, what is the maximum amount of memory used in any one of these memory spaces, right? So it will give you output on a per memory space, uh, uh, no, per memory space. Memory usage, essentially gives you timelines for every memory space, you know, how much memory you have used in, in each of these things. And memory events actually gives you a lot of output. It's, it's something which is more used for debugging. What that does is it actually prints out for every allocation, deallocation, deep copy and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it prints out stuff like, which time did that happen? Uh, what pointer was involved? What was the size of the thing? Uh, what was the memory space? What operation was it? What was the name of the views? And uh, it also tell, marks up like regions, right? So you can actually see in which region something happened. And what you see here is that in this iterate region, you see this allocate temp, deallocate temp, allocate temp, deallocate temp, right? So this is actually something which is relatively useful for figuring out, you know, if you, if you had like, uh, if you spend lots of time in like allocating and deallocating in Cocos view initialize, right? Uh, you can actually see this here as well, right? You can see if you have these things where you created temporary allocations and uh, create them, destroy them like all the time and can find that. We actually had uh, a funny anecdote where, where somebody came to us and said, 
oh, he needs to figure out why his code is so slow. In particular, he sees that in one of his unit tests where the code is really, really slow and we need to optimize the kernel. And what we did then is we ran the simple kernel timer. And the simple kernel timer said, said that you spend 0.05% of your time in set of kernels. And you're like, OK, that probably means that we shouldn't optimize your kernel. We should figure out where you spend all your time. So we ran the memory event tool. And it turns out that in his, uh, in his run, he, he created something like uh, a million uh, views and destroyed them again. And uh, that was just because he did that in a, in a loop and, or in, in some kind of loop. And he could actually just take the temporary allocation outside of the loop. And taking the temporary allocation outside of the loop uh, made his whole uh, code run something like uh, a thousand times faster. So, you know, that's a good thing to know. Okay, so we had these push pop regions earlier marked up here uh, in this example. Uh, what this can do is these markers can capture you more of your code structure. So it's really helpful also for finding where time is spent outside of kernels. You know, it's really useful to grouping kernels together. Like you can say something like, you know, this is the solve phase, this is the setup phase, this is the uh, time iteration loop, you know, this is the particle part, this is the implicit part or something like that. It's a really simple interface. So you just say Cocos profiling colon colon push region and give it a label and pop region and um, you know, it's, it's really just a kind of a stack, right? The simplest tool to use that is the space time stack tool uh, that really leverages that interface. And it gives you bottom up and top down data representations. It can do MPI aggregation if you compile with MPI support. And then in that case, it will also tell you something about like uh, MPI imbalance between ranks. Um, and it also aggregates like memory utilization info. But if you see that, you know, Running this little code, you see here the uh, the two regions, right? It tells you what, whether some some timing is for a region or for for like a kernel or something. So it has here the regions, and then nested in the regions, right? It has the in, in the iterate region, it has the K1 kernel, the Cocos view initialization, and the K2 kernel, and nested in the setup region, it has the A to A mirror copy and the init A uh, loop. Right? And then outside of any region was the two initializations, right, for A and for A mirror uh, using for loops. So, you know, this is something which gives you a really nice structure, you know, using your names uh, for your entire code and you can check, you know. You can also then check, you know, how much of, if I sum up all these kind of, uh, you know, uh, kernel times, does that actually match with the, 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 the region time, right? And if it doesn't, then there must be something going on in that region, you know, which isn't captured by Cocos operations. And then down here, it tells you, you know, the, the, the max utilization, uh, max memory allocated in each of these things, so essentially the high watermark, and it tells you which views were using up that memory during your, when you hit your high watermark. So it's relatively easy to figure out, you know, who's your memory hawk. Okay. Another thing we can use tools for is debugging. One of the typical canonical problems we have in, in finding errors in, in like Cocos code or generally in, in like, you know, code with accelerators is that uh, non-blocking dispatch actually implies also that the errors are reported asynchronously. So for example, you have this thing, right? Say we do this push region here, we, we run a parallel four, we, uh, and then run a parallel reduce, right? But in the parallel 4, I made a mistake. Instead of just going over n, which is the length of a, you know, which I use also in the second kernel, I go over 2n. So I'm getting, a, I'm expecting a, a segmentation fault, right? And, you know, I got a segmentation fault, you know, here I ran that thing, test CUDA, and uh, because in order to find what I, where I'm crashing, right, um, a lot of people still do printf debugging. I put a printf here, past point a. But the thing is, it actually prints past point a. Right, and then crashes. And the crash is not in a point which tells you something really useful, right? It tells you it crashes in a CUDA stream synchronize. And you're like, CUDA stream synchronize? Where do I see a CUDA stream synchronize? Uh, and it happens in CUDA instance CPP 312, right? Which is really not helpful to you. What actually happened is it, 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 it found the error during the parallel reduce, which because I'm writing back into a, uh, into a into a scalar value, does the synchronization of the uh, of this kernel of this dispatch in order to copy this value back, right? 
And during that synchronization, we check an error. And so we find the error, which was actually coming from the guy before. So what we can do now is we can use Coco's tools to help with some debugging functionality. And one of the most useful ones I found is this kernel logger. It's a tool which essentially helps you localize errors and check what the actual runtime flow of your code is. Uh, as we have a tools, it inserts fences and fences in Cocos check for errors. So if you write Cocos fence or, uh, you know, CUDA stream fence or whatever, as a, you know, like from an instance of fence, we actually do check errors. And, um, and this is something we can use. On top of it, this kernel logger essentially prints at runtime out what operation, operations are happening. Right, so an output you get from kernel logger for this case is you get the allocate, you know, for A, which happened somewhere before the code, when you get the parallel four for the initialization, and it tells you here, I'm executing a parallel four on device zero, and it starts, you know, it gives you the name, view initialization, then it tells you, oh, this kernel is now done, right? Uh, then it enters a profile region iterate, right? And it starts executing a kernel. Now, because it's inside a, a, a region, it first prints the, the region stack and then the name of the kernel. And now you get the crash. You don't get the, you know, I'm complete with that kernel. You just get the crash. And that means K1 was the kernel which crashed. Okay. It didn't print the, it didn't print the pass point A anymore. Right. So this tool is really easy. You know, you, you just, when you have a crash, run this tool and go to the last print line from Cocos P to figure out what was the operation which crashed. And as I said, this works on the released builds, right? Even without debug symbols, this just works on any build. So what is the standard profiling approach you should take? The standard profiling approach is what I usually recommend to people is, you know, you start with just understanding Cocos utilization. How much time do you actually spend instead of Cocos using the simple kernel timer, right? Then the next thing is, in particular, if you don't spend like 95% of your time in Cocos kernels, try and figure out, you know, uh, what is your memory utilization and how much, uh, how many allocations and deallocations do you do? And you can do that, for example, with memory events, right? Uh, and generally, 5,000 allocations per second is okay, but if you do more than that, then you are in trouble. What you can do with that is you can identify temporary allocations, you know, which you might be able to hoist. So that's something to do. Then you can do identify more serial code regions, for example, with a space time stack uh, after you added profiling regions, right? You just add profiling regions all over your code. And uh, then you find the regions which have a low fraction of their time spent in kernels, right? And dive into that. And after that, you know, if you really found now, okay, now my problem is I need to optimize kernels. You dive into individual kernels and that's where you use connector tools, which we will discuss next, uh, to analy analyze kernels with the specific, uh, uh, you know, with vendor specific tools or tools which uh, do more things like sampling and stuff like that of your hardware. Uh, for example, you could do like roofline analysis of on find underperforming code, right? Okay, we have an exercise for that. Uh, Actually, I think we forgot to copy it over. So we'll do that right after this lecture. But essentially, this is a mini-MD variant. And this mini-MD variant uh, is, is uh, uh, I cribbled it, right? I made it run slower. And I did that through something not completely stupid. Uh, but basically, the task here is you use the standard profiling approach, find the code location which caused the performance issue. And uh, you, don't, you don't have to fix it, right? You just need to find it and uh, you know, figure out what's going on, right? Generally, what you should expect from something like MiniMD that uh, you should about spend you know, about 50% of your time in force compute kernels and 25% of your time in neighborless creation, right? And uh, if you know, you're way off from that uh, for this code, then something is wrong. So as a summary, Cocos tools provide an instrumentation interface, Cocos P, and the tools which leverage that. The interface is always there, even in full release builds. It's zero overhead if you do not load the tool. And you load tools either through Cocos profile library or callbacks, uh, which you can set within your, in your code. And we'll discuss those uh, later. <laughs>
So any questions I need to answer? No. Okay, let's get to vendor and independent profiling, uh, you know, graphical interfaces. And that is where um, these connector tools essentially help you to translate Cocos instrumentation to the instrumentation of these other tools, you know, something these tools can understand. Uh, so we're gonna look at, you know, how these connectors work and uh, what tools, uh, you know, are kind of uh, available. So basically the idea here is that Cocos tools can be used to interface uh, and augment, you know, these existing profiling tools. So we can provide these context information like your kernel names to uh, these third party tools. Uh, we can also do things like turn data collection on and off and I'll show you that uh, later uh, in a tool independent way. And where basically two ways this happens, right? One is you load a specific connector tool like NVProf connector, which you can download from uh, I think. Or, uh, you know, and that works for things like inside systems and VTune and stuff like that. Uh, or there's actually a lot of tools or some tools now which know about Cocos instrumentation. For example, Tau actually knows about Cocos itself and will just leverage that Cocos uh, uh, instrumentation layer, you know, if it finds that it's there. So how do you connect to tools? Let's, uh, the first one we talk about is the NVProf connector. Uh, and it's named NVProf connector for historical reasons. It's actually using the NVTX instrumentation layer uh, from NVIDIA. So it works really with any tool which understands NVTX. Uh, and that includes like, uh, you know, uh, inside systems. And uh, what that does is it translates regions and kernel dispatches, right? So if you do a pop region, push region, or the, the kernels, right, uh, it will mark that up. Initially, it wasn't really super useful because uh, regions were, you know, the, the way you marked up stuff in NVTX, that was actually just showing up separately, like even on a separate pane in the, in the, uh, uh, in the inside uh, systems kind of like, uh, you know, graphical user interface. And so you had to kind of line up, you know, oh, what is the region, you know, what is the kernel within that region to figure out what is the kernel with the name you gave it. But, we talked to NVIDIA about that, and since CUDA 11, you can actually add renaming of kernels uh, uh, as an optional thing inside of, inside of inside systems. You can turn that on, and then you actually get full renaming of your things. So how does that work? Uh, it works like all the other tools as well. You set uh, in, you, you know, you, you load the NVProf connector uh, via setting Cocos profile library. So you just put that into the run configuration inside of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, inside systems. And then you should go to tools, preferences, uh, rename CUDA kernels uh, by NVTX and set that to on. Okay. And what that does is it now uses labels as the primary name. So if you look carefully on the left here, you see now the K1 and K2 and Cocos view initialization and stuff like that show now up as your primary uh, naming facility. Uh, also, the bars are now labeled. Right, so if you go into one of these bars, you see that it starts with a K1 name and then the actual global function name. You still get the full global function name, you know, which would be reported otherwise, which is this long, long, long demangled uh, thing, right? But it starts with the name. Furthermore, what you can do is you can expand this little uh, arrow here on the left. And so if multiple kernels were named the same way, you can still see the different kernels, right? If you accidentally gave two different kernels the same name, they will show up in the same line here, but if you expand it, they show up in two different ones, okay? Uh, and what you now can do is you can click now on one individual kernel, right? And just analyze that one individual kernel instance even of a specific kernel, okay? No. So there's a similar thing for NVProf. What you do with NVProf is the same thing, right? You set uh, Cocos, uh, no, not NVProf, VTune for Intel. What you do is you set Cocos profile library in the run configuration to a VTune connector. And then you go to this frame domain frame function call stack grouping in the bottom up panel. I'll show a picture of that in a second. And what that is, now you have labels as the primary name for your things, right? That's what primarily uh, turns up. 
as in uh, inside, uh, inside systems, you can expand to see individual kernel invocations, and you can then even dive further, right? You can expand further and see the calls inside of your kernel, right? Function calls you have to inside of your kernel. And you then can focus in on a single kernel, right? And do an anal analysis, like, analysis like, you know, how many, how many memory loads did you do? How many uh, floating point operations did you do in an individual kernel instance, right? Uh, there's also the VTune focus connector, which is used in conjunction with a kernel filter tool. I'm not going to go in detail of that, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to give a list of kernels you want to profile, and then it will turn on VTune just for that one thing. This is really useful because some of the analysis passes in, in VTune make your kernels run like 50 to 100x slower. And so if you are just interested in one particular kernel, right, it makes a lot of sense to turn VTune only on for that one particular kernel instead of for everything, so that you do not slow down the entire run, but just the part you actually want to look into. So this is an output from that. It's actually from a slightly different code. Um, what you see here is, you see uh, that it named these guys, you know, Perl4.xp, so that was a Perl4 call. The name you gave it was xp. It says here Perl reduce dot dot, right? Um, this last one, Perl 4 main blah, 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 was essentially an unnamed lambda, right? So this was a lambda and we didn't give it a name inside of main. But uh, you see here the expansion of a Perl 4, you see the first, you know, the, the three times that kernel was called and you can click on individual calls here and, uh, you know, uh, you can either expand further, you know, to see what function calls happen inside of that, or you can click on this guy and then figure out, you know, what's the instruction mix in that particular instance of a kernel. And you see here the grouping was this frame domain frame function call stack thing. Another tool is this tower thing. Uh, it's a widely used profiling tool, you know, which actually supports most platforms. So that's one of the really nice things about it. If you know how to use tau, right, you can actually use tau on, you know, on NVIDIA machines, on Intel machines and stuff like that. So which is really, uh, really nice, right? You don't need to learn, you know, inside systems and VTune and blah, blah, blah. Also tau does MPI, right? And understands MPI, which uh, VTune and insights have significant problems with, right? It supports different things. It pro supports profiling, it supports sampling, it supports tracing. And the nice thing is you do not need a connector tool for Tau. So Tau on its own actually understands uh, Cocos. And so what you do is you just download and install Tau. You uh, launch the program with Tau exec, which will, uh, uh, which will set things like Cocos profile library for you. Uh, and you know, if you have questions, ask the, uh, go to the email list, they actually are really responsive. So, uh, you know, if you want to try this, you know, talk to them or talk to us, right? And we'll can try and help you. Here's a, uh, here's a sample of what you get, right? Uh, again, you basically get now these names, you know, based on, uh, you know, you get both uh, uh, the regions showing up, iterate and setup, and you get the Perl fours and Perl reduces and Perl, you know, with the, with the names of the kernels when after that. So, uh, you know, which is much better than getting getting uh, weird output, which tells you you spend all of your time inside of Cocos, OMP, uh, Perl, or something like that. The last tool I want to show a little bit detail is time memory. It's actually something uh, which is largely also developed by one of the uh, people who work on Cocos too. So if you have questions on that, you know, come to our Slack channel. It's really a, um, another, you know, multi-architecture profiling tool, which provides a lot of different things, right? So you have a lot of measurement capabilities built in. Um, the idea here is that this tool essentially avoids a lot of like setting up complicated environment variables. And there's, uh, what we are trying to do is trying to develop these different connector libraries for different tasks. So you have, everything is time memory based, but you can then load a tool which does, you know, um, I don't know, roofline analysis and another tool which tells you, you know, memory bandwidth analysis, uh, you know, instruction mix analysis, you know, stuff like that. Um, and one of the things it can do is it actually can simultaneously do it for CPUs and GPUs, right? For example, roofline modeling, which is kind of cool. So what you do is you build the tool, you set your Cocos profile library, and you know if you need more information, you can go there. Here's one of my examples. Uh, this is a 
uh, a roofline model of this little toy coat. So the toy coat uh, in particular, since I ran really small amount of uh, instructions, right, it, uh, it didn't run very efficient uh, because everything was kind of launch latency. So that's why the dots are all down here. But basically what you see is you see here um, the iterate, right? So it essentially gives you a roof line for the whole region, right? In the, in the whole region, how much arithmetic intensity that you have there, right? And then individual kernels, uh, you know, K1, K2 and stuff like that, um, you know, telling you what's happening there. There's some other tools, things like Caliber, you know, uh, which has a lot of broad analysis capabilities, you know, also in particular UVM. Profiling HPC Toolkit is a tool which is uh, now really pushed a lot by uh, by DOE. So that's something you know the different labs are kind of uh, coalescing around as one of the primary analysis tools. Again, this guy doesn't need a connector; it just does uh, you know it's a sampling tool and it has good Cocos support, right? So it knows about Cocos instrumentation too, and can show all of that stuff up. So the idea here is connectors, you know, they help you to inject Cocoa specific information into vendor and academic tools. It helps you with readability of profiles and stuff like that. It in particular removes the need to put vendor specific instrumentation in your code. So if you otherwise would have put, you know, NVTX instrumentation directly into your code, don't just use the Cocos profiling, push region, pop region, stuff, et cetera, and uh, use the, uh, you know, connector tool to translate it into NVTX. So that way, you know, your, your instrumentation also works for ITT and, and, uh, and other things like that. And generally, there's this growing list of tools, you know, which actually support Cocos natively. Okay, do we have questions on that? No question. Good. Now, we'll come to an interesting topic, which is tuning. Uh, so as I said earlier, tuning is something we just uh, got into our release. So 3.2 is the first release, which has these tuning capabilities. Uh, and what we're gonna look at is, you know, why do we need this, you know? Uh, and then we talk a bit about, you know, what are the, what are the concepts inside of uh, the tuning interface? So what are things like input and output variables? How you register parameters for tuning and then, uh, you know, an example using the Apollo Tuner, which is one of the tuning tools we have available. So let's look at the canonical implementation for SPMV, the sparse matback in Cocos, right? This is one of the things, you know, it's a, it's a widely used uh, code in some sense. It's actually not too far off from what Cocos kernels does if you don't like use QSparse or something like that. And um, it's an interesting target for auto-tuning actually. So how this works is, uh, if you remember, we talked about SPMV last week. Uh, what it does is it, it has the sparse representation of the metrics and there's many rows. And for every row, we know where the, where the values start for that and where they end for that. And so every row can actually have like a different length, right? In terms of number of non-zeros, so how many entries are non-zero. So the way we run a good SPMV on that is we, figure out how many rows we want to assign to a Cocos team uh, because we're gonna use the team policy. So we'll figure that out. Then we divide number of rows by rows per team and that's how many teams we start. Uh, you know, in reality, we need to make sure that we take care of the remainders. But in this case, I just assume that N rows is, you know, equal the dividable by rows per team. We then tell it the team size and the vector length. So with every team, then we split the rows, you know, via team thread range. So we figure out where does our, uh, where does the rows start for this team by multiplying team league rank with rows per team. And when we start where start row and go to start row plus rows per team. And that gets a row index. So from that we can figure out the begin index and end index for each row. And with that we do a parallel reduction to do the dot product of a row with a right hand side vector with a thread vector range. And so we use the IDX begin and IDX end here. So there is a number of things, uh, there's essentially three parameters uh, which we can choose, which are independent of the problem, right? With every choice of these parameters, this should work. One is rows per team. How many rows do I assign to each team? The next is the team size. How big do I make each team? And then the vector length. How, many, how big a vector length do I want to use for the dot product? And 
these parameters depend largely on three factors. You know, which architecture are you on, right? Like on a CPU, for example, team size is basically always one. While on GPUs, you don't want that. Then how many rows are in A, right? If you have a few rows in A, then probably the ratio of rows per team to team size should be pretty small. Why? Well, if you have a lot of rows, you know, you can make that larger. And then how many non-zeros are in A, which actually in together with the rows number gives you how, many, how long is your average row. And how long is your average row impacts strongly what choice you should make for vector length. And finding the right parameters for that is actually a pretty daunting task. So generally heuristics are possible, right? And we have done that, uh, you know, uh, in Cocos kernels, for example. So in Cocos kernels, we wrote a heuristic for this kernel. And this heuristic was really good on K80s, right? The initial one we had. And it was actually beating on, you know, at the time it was beating cruise bars on K80s for a wide range of matrices. While at the same time, it was actually the, you know, the heuristic was also way of like KNL. And on KNL, it was better than MKL, Intel's math library. But that heuristic failed then hor horribly on V100. Compared to a better heuristic we later developed, we gave up like 2x or something in average performance. Uh, so what we needed to do is we needed now to adapt our heuristic and make it aware of both like older GPUs and newer GPUs. But now we also have AMD GPUs coming, we have Intel GPUs coming and stuff like that. And it's just really hard to figure out, you know, uh, right heuristics for all of it. And you have to touch this stuff again and again. Sure, for something like Cocos kernels, it's probably worthwhile to do that and we might do that. But in generally, you know, it's really hard for people to keep up with that. What we found a lot of folks are doing is, right, they tune all their parameters one time when we wrote the code. And then they often forget about that for, in particular, in large code bases. In particular, if maybe the developer of that particular functionality left the lab, right? Uh, and so we forget about, oh, you know, actually we get a new machine, we should tune these parameters again. And uh, so what we've seen is that people, you know, tuned that and then for the next 10 years, they lose performance because they tuned it for, I don't know, Pentium 4, right? And it's not optimal anymore for Sandy Bridge or Skylake or something like that. So the question is, what if you could auto-tune these parameters instead, right? So what information would we actually need to provide and what comes out of the, uh, of the auto-tuning? So what we need for tuning is we need context information. We need information such as problem size, right? Like in the SPMV, we need the information about like how many rows are there and how many non-zeros are there, right? That's information we need to provide. Uh, we need to provide multiple inputs of different types. For example, one input is through the auto-tuner, oh, this is SPMV and not dot product, right? So, uh, you know, and, and that information is a categorical thing, right? It just says, oh, this is kernel A and this is kernel B, right? While, uh, while like problem size is something which can, can scale, right? Uh, we need to pro be able to provide multiple inputs, right, of different types. We need to be able to uh, have multiple potentially correlated parameters. And we potentially need different tuning strategies in different areas, right? Not every tuning strategy works well, right? And some problems, a simple kind of steepest descent method, you know, will just work fine. In other problems, you know, that's not good at all, right? And you run into, you run into like a local minimum, and then you're stuck in that local minimum in terms of like time, while there might be a much better configuration somewhere else. So, Cocos tuning provides a flexible runtime auto tuning interface, which allows you to do all of these things. Generally, the infrastructure is really very flexible and it makes it right now a little bit more complex than is desirable. There is some ideas we have for, uh, you know, providing some easier uh, user facing interfaces for some of the things. And um, I will glance about some of the aspects here. I'll show you the actual code later. But uh, some of the stuff I'll show you, which I have now as helper functions initially, is you know, the kind of interfaces we think about uh, standardizing later. Okay, but let's talk about the four fundamental concepts of tuning. 
First, we have input types. And these input types are essentially described descriptors for the type of input information you have for a tuning task, right? Uh, then there's output types. And the output types describe how the output variables work. They actually also describe kind of the search space, right? So, uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit again. Then there's variable values, which are instances of either input types or output types. And there's contacts, which are essentially markers for tuning scopes. So these types for input and output variables, um, you know, essentially describe what makes sense for both inputs and for outputs. They're not really types in the C++ sense, as not strictly. Uh, for example, they can contain runtime information, such, such as candidate sets, right? For a vector length, for example, you know, uh, you do not want any integer value, right? You want powers of two. So this is essentially where this is coming from, right? We we thought about, you know, what is the different optimization spaces of variables and also the different input spaces, right? And if you think about, you know, what is the different optimization spaces, there's this one thing, you know, where I said, oh, only certain values make sense, two, four, eight, 16, right? Uh, that is candidate set. In other cases, you have a whole range which works, right? Zero to N. What if it's floating point numbers, right? When you have essentially infinite number of values available. Uh, then the question is, how should you search in such ranges, right? Is this a range where, like for floating point numbers in particular, which is linear, or is logarithmic search making more sense, right? Um, and, and so, you know, that's the, uh, that's the stuff, you know, you need to think about. And as I said, uh, one thing we have is we, we, or we need still is we will provide these helper functions for like typical scenarios, right? Like for example, uh, you know, you just have a set of concrete values. So why not concrete create that type of uh, from directly from a slit vector or something like that. So both tuning variables, input and output need to accommodate these situations. So what I'm going to do when I'm walking through the interface for a little bit here, uh, I'm highlighting all the interface which is actually public, like uh, Cocos interface. And um, all of these things are currently in Cocos tools experimental, right? Because this interface is still experimental. Uh, and, and some of these helper functions I'm using here, uh, we'll discuss later. So first I need tuning types, right? And I create them in this case through uh, through the uh, uh, through these helper functions, the create tuning output type and tuning input type. So I create, for example, an output type here just from a candidate set. Okay, um, and I'll show you these functions later. Then, when you have these types, which are essentially just handles to internally registered types, so that's why we are size t's. You can create variables of that type, and they. They are all, you know, in the C++ tent, they are all variable values. And you make that variable value from a type ID and uh, you give it a name. In this case, the input types here are just kernel names, right? Essentially, what is the kernel? So I just named them A and B. Now, the actual region where you want to do something is scoped. Okay, so you need to get this kind of context ID and then you tell it begin context and end context. And this is the tuned region. So the timing happens between begin and end context. It also defines the scope in which variables exist. So what you do is you set input values from the input values we just defined, you know, and associate with them with that context. Uh, you also then request, request output values, right? So that's where this tuned value is coming from. So we just use categorical input values here, you know, essentially just marking up, oh, this is region one, this is region two, right? But for SPMV, there would be multiple of these guys, right? Things like optimal vector length, uh, you know, a vector length and, uh, no, not vector length, um, things like row length, average row length, uh, total number of rows and stuff like that, right? Uh, if there is only one matrix, this category would work, right? If there's only one matrix, you only need to tell it, this is the SPMV of that matrix, right? But if not, 
you need to tell you need to tell the tool oh now it's a different metrics right and so by registering also like input values like the number of rows and stuff like that with it it can uh, can do that uh, the reason why the number of rows is not a categorical value but more like a range is that you probably could write tools which can interpolate between different uh, uh, things that actually has data for right so you train for example a model on a set of matrices you know which are characterized through these parameters and then you can use the trained model for other matrices too where it just interpolates between these guys um, in either case, in this case, we just used one input variable and one output variable. But that is where this second one here is coming from. It essentially tells you how many variables are there. And what you actually give it, you give it pointers to uh, arrays of these uh, variable values. Right? So you can have multiple input values and multiple output values. Uh, so the create, the thing we had before, right, uh, where we created the tuning output type, actually use something like this as a helper function, right? So it got this stood vector here, and uh, it then set all these different uh, parameters for the, for the type, right? Like, oh, this is, this is a value category, right? This is whether it's a value you know, of int 64 or double. Uh, it tells you here, oh, the, the thing is actually a value set or not a range, right? Stuff like that. The categorical one was a little bit easier, right? It's uh, said just, oh, it's a value categorical and the value type is a string and, uh, you know, it's unbounded in terms of what this thing can be, right? Um, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to give you more overloads for these kind of things, you know, later in practice. And so it's going to be easier to create these guys. Okay. Uh, one of the tools we have available is Apollo. Uh, it's the most feature-rich tuning tool we currently have available targeting this interface. Uh, it builds decision tree based models and it can retrain models if it observes that expected performance you know, devi deviates from what it actually measures right now during a run. Uh, and you can save these models for sub subsequent runs. How do you use that? You essentially just set Cocos profile library to that uh, lib Apollo tuner and then you run your executable. This is a case here where we ran with SPMV and we uh, uh, used the, our team as like one sub project of Apollo and for different matrices. And you saw that, you know, compared to for heuristic, we got uh, in particular for larger matrices, we, we managed to get quite a bit of like performance improvement out of it. Um, so, a couple of rules for how to use this, right? One of the things is, if you do not load a tool, right, this should still work. And basically, as, uh, all these, all these uh, uh, calls gonna end up being pretty much warp tools. So what you should do is, you should initialize like the, the, the requested values, right, the output values, you should initialize them with some kind of sane, uh, you know, useful uh, default value. So that if you don't use a tool, you know, so you still get that default value. Um, then obviously no choice, right, from the set or range of candidates or whatever, right, should crash your programs, uh, your program, right. Options can be slow, but they all must be functional, right. And you should only call, or you can only call in set input values and request output values once per context, okay, not multiple times. So in the future, we're gonna, we actually want to combine that with like in auto tuning for internal variables, like, you know, team size, vector length, tile sizes for MD range policy and the CUDA block size, you know, occupancy of kernels and stuff like that. So essentially the idea is that if you give us to for the team policy, for example, the auto, auto, right, instead of just using a heuristic, we are actually gonna run auto tuning underneath. But we often would need more context, right? If we run auto tuning for this, the only information we really have is we have the label, we have the iteration range, and we have the kernel type ID, right? And that's it. We don't have anything else. Uh, so automatic tuning of these variables instead of just using some kind of heuristic is probably more useful 
if you also provide us with uh, more uh, with more context information. For example, we can't distinguish two matrices with the same row count, but vastly different row lengths, right? I couldn't do that here. I couldn't distinguish, you know, if you launch a stencil with MD range policy and uh, a stencil calculation and your functor has an option to do like, uh, for like a runtime depth of, uh, of a stencil, right? Whether you go one layer or two layers or something. I couldn't distinguish between those two things, uh, situations, but likely the optimal parameters depend on that, right? So it would still be helpful for you to set context around that and provide that additional information, even if we auto tune, you know, auto or something like that. So as a summary, the Cocos tuning hooks enable you to get more performance portability. Essentially, it would allow you to avoid figuring out the right heuristics for every platform. And that's in particular, you know, getting useful when you target all these different things, right? Intel, NVIDIA, AMD GPUs, ARM, Intel, IBM, AMD CPUs, etc. right? You do not really want to try and tune this for all of these things. In particular, you might not be able to because you don't have access to all of these things, right? But your users might. And so, uh, you know, the auto-tuning allows them to just load a tuning tool and get good parameters, you know, for, for their architecture. Uh, from the app side, you provide input variables to describe the context. So you, uh, these input variables are essentially descriptors of a problem scope. You have categorical uh, input variables, ranges, sets, and stuff like that. Uh, you describe the scaling for ranges, such as logarithmic or linear, to help, you know, uh, figuring out uh, how to interpolate, for example. When the app requests output variables, it's kind of the same types, or it's the same type system as the input variables, and that essentially allows you to describe the search space for tools. As I said, this whole thing is in experimental and will stay in experimental for a while, but if you are willing to try this out, you know, try this out, tell us what works, what doesn't work for you, uh, tell us what kind of tools, you know, you might want to work. And if you are, if you are into writing tools, maybe even things like machine learning, right? Uh, it's something where you could probably do some cool stuff. Like for example, you, I could imagine a tool which also uses time memory or something like that, right? Uh, you get the instruction mix at runtime of your, of a kernel, right? Uh, and then use the instruction mix to, uh, you know, go into like a machine learned model, which figures out what is the best parameters if you have that particular instruction mix. Things like that, I think, are you know potentially useful. Okay, do we have questions on that? No, no question. You can continue. Okay. So now the next thing I want to talk about is how you would actually write your own tools for the Cocos P interface, and also why you would want to you do that. So the whole idea of the interface was that other people can write tools, right? And it should be relatively simple. So it's really just implementing a relatively simple C interface. You only have to implement what you want to use. So you don't have to use, uh, implement the entire Cocos P interface. You just have to implement the function calls you are interested in. And you get access to the entire instrumentation layer of Cocos, right? So there's no internal instrumentation which isn't exposed. Um, so why would you want to do that? So one thing is that you could write profiling tools which know about your code structure and then properly like uh, format output, you know, categorize output and stuff like that, right? Uh, if you're on a big complex application, you know, with tons of libraries and stuff like that, like, you know, uh, like our Sierra tool, uh, you know, uh, engineering suite, which uses Trillinox, right? In total, it's like, you know, applications are hundreds of thousands of lines of code using millions of lines of libraries. And, uh, you know, you have then 10,000 kernels in, in, uh, in, a, uh, in, in a run, right? So being able to categorize that stuff properly, you know, split that into the solver phase, uh, the assembly phase and stuff like that might be useful. You know, you could blend out, for example, all the information which, you know, all the profiling stuff from like tools you're not interested, you know, or libraries you're not interested in. 
This could also be combined to do things like in situ analysis, you know, hooking that into your CI system, right? You do that as part of your continuous integration and look at certain kernels, you know, but the performance doesn't change, things like that. You could write debugging tools for specific, which are specific for your framework. And I'll actually show you a throwaway debugging tool in a bit later. Uh, and that's another thing. Sometimes it actually looks like it might be sh faster and cheaper to just write a debugging tool, which extracts information out of your app than trying to add uh, output information to your app and recompiling that whole thing. Because as I said, all these tools work with your release build. Right. So what we will do is we will work, walk through the hooks and then we'll illustrate that with, with, with an example. So there's two helper classes, which are a little bit unfortunate, but you know, it is what it is. Basically copy them into your tool. Cocos P device info and space handle and they just have like this device ID and the name in it. Then there's the initialization and finalization hooks. So the initialization hooks is like just Cocos P in a library and it gets you uh, some information like a version number and stuff like that. You better make sure that you know your version number matches up with what our interface internally is. It tells you what the device, uh, how many devices uh, Cocos initialized and it will give you these device IDs. I said it's called during Cocos initialize. Uh, it provides these device IDs, which will be used subsequently. And uh, this is essentially what you use to set up, you know, tool infrastructure. When there's a finalized call, that is getting called during Cocos finalize. Um, and usually what tools use that for is to output results, right? That's the place after which nothing happens anymore. You know, no Cocos stuff at least happens. And that means you can just write out everything to a file, for example. So the primary calls obviously are the begin parallel calls and the end parallel calls. So that marks like parallel force, parallel reductions, and parallel scans. Uh, what that gives you is the name of the operation, it gives you a device ID, and then there's this pointer to kernel ID, and that's the thing you have to set, right? Because uh, you give us back that kernel ID and we'll, we'll call end parallel for with that ID again, so that you can match these guys up. Um, yeah. That's basically it, right? Where's the begin deep copy and deep copy? These guys give you the space handles for the destination and source, which are essentially just containing the names of the distant of the memory spaces. Uh, will give you uh, the the names of the allocations, the pointers of the allocations, and the size. And that's essentially called, you know, the begin deep copy is called when the deep copy starts, and the end deep copy is called when the deep copy ends. There's also the calls for allocate and deallocate, which also give you like the space handle, the name and the pointers and the sizes. And that's called when allocating or deallocating data. Sometimes it actually would be useful to build these tools into an executable. What it allows you to do is you can actually turn on like profiling or something like that through like command line arguments, for example, right? And you don't need to even tell your users to set some environment variable or something like that. You can do it all internally. Uh, and Cocos provides now a callback setting system, which allows you to do that. That's part of the last release. So that didn't exist in 3.1, it's only in 3.2. And what that takes the form of is that you have essentially something like that. Set, then the hook name and callback, and then you give it a function pointer. And a hook here is really any of all of these guys, right? Init, finalized, push region, pop region, begin parallel four, in parallel four, begin parallel reduce, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so you can, you can set these guys there. One little caveat, uh, you need to set the init hook before you call Cocos initialize, right? Because during Cocos initialize, we check what the init hook is. That's the only place where this would ever uh, be called. Um, you can also store a callback set and re reload it and pause tool calls. So you can do this get callbacks to get a set of all the existing callbacks right now, and then do set callbacks later to set it back to that thing, right? So you can actually switch in different phases between like different profiling tools or something like that. And then you can pause tools and resume tools. You know, that's the thing with uh, that instrumentation which allows you to uh, uh, turn profiling on and off within your code. 
here's an example for what callback registration, right? I just have the uh, Cocos P allocate data and Cocos P deallocate data here. Um, remember, if you do that as a separate tool, you have to mark them X turn C. If you compile them in as part of your tool, you don't, right? Because when you do not uh, deal open them, we just set a function pointer and that works uh, with C++ itself. So then you essentially initialize, I set allocate data and set deallocate data. And um, you know, then these guys get caught. So one of the ideas here would, for example, be writing throwaway debugging tools, right? Say you want to know what is inside of a device view, a CUDA view, right? Before and, and, uh, before and after entering a kernel for the fifth time, a specific kernel, right? So it's on, a, on the GPU, right? It's on some rank of a large run and recompiling the app takes hours. Right, so what you do is instead you just run, uh, you write a simple Cocos tool, which can do that for you. What do we need? We need to figure out what is this pointer and the size of a view with a specific label when it gets allocated. And when we print that view, when entering a kernel and before exiting it. And maybe, you know, if you want to be sure, make sure the view didn't get it deallocated in the meantime. So how does that look? We have a store function, right? We just make a little tool where we have a global pointer, a global n and a global count for you know, how often did we enter the, enter the specific uh, kernel. Then we do uh, a hook for the Cocos P allocate data. We check the name of the allocation and we now want to just check what's in puppy weights before and after. Uh, we then get the data pointer. Um, actually, there's a little caveat here. Uh, that our data allocations in Cocos, they are a little bit larger than you think because we allocate like a header where we store like the string and stuff like that. And so the actual data is offset by, uh, by 128 bytes. Um, there's actually a macro for that. So we'll expose that macro, you know, that you know what that number is. And then we set the size and we set the count to zero, right, of how often did we enter the kernel. Uh, we have a print data function, right? We'll just create a std vector. We mem copy the thing into that std vector from the device pointer, and then we'll just print every one of these uh, elements out. And then in the begin panel four, right? We'll check what the name of the kernel is. If the kernel is puppy on couch, then we'll increment our counter. And if the counter is five, we'll print the data. And then we'll send back, you know, kernel ID one, uh, and otherwise kernel ID zero. And if in the, in the end kernel for kernel ID one, uh, you know, it's kernel ID one, we print the data again, right? And, you know, writing those 20, 30 lines isn't probably taking that much time. And now if you do that with a code like this, well, in this case, obviously recompiling the code wouldn't have been that hard either. You know, you get exactly that kind of output, right? Expect. Right, you get the 0, 4, 8, 12 before the kernel and the 5, 10, 15 after. So summarizing this, implementing your own tools is pretty easy. You can simply implement the needed C callback functions. Uh, only implement what you need. By the way, even if you implement it as a library, right? While you need to mark the function as extern C, right? So the symbol needs to be exported. In the implementation, in the innards of a function, you can still use C++. Right? That's how C, as it was, C export works. And basically, what we are trying to do is we try to make that simple enough that you can write one-off tools you know, for your use cases. There's also a callback registration for application, and that callback registration allows you to embed tools inside of applications. Uh, one of the future ideas we have is we actually might just give you a library you know, where we compile all our known Cocos tools into a library. You can link against that library and you get like uh, uh, callback sets, you know, from that. And you can just say in your thing, you know, uh, set callback set to simple kernel timer, you know, or something like that. So, um, and then you, can, then you can load these tools from like, you know, with a command line argument or something like that. Okay. That's it on custom tools. I'm gonna hand off now to uh, Drew 
who is doing our claim based static analysis stuff. All right, can y'all hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, unfortunately, somehow my slide number is off by one, but hopefully that won't be too much of an issue. Can everyone see my slide now with the 65 instead of a 64? Yes. All right. So today I'm gonna to tell you about some clang based static analysis that we've been working on. Um, and the, the goal is really to introduce the possibility that we can have Cocoa specific warnings in your code. I'll then show you the three classes of errors that we can detect. I will show you how to use the tools and then we are the tool and then we can talk about the current and planned warnings. So the, the first thing we're going to answer is like, what would it look like or can we have Cocoa specific warnings? And in this case, we have um, the spoo oops called inside of a Cocos Lambda. And that foo oops does not have a Cocos function annotation on it. And if you're on certain backends, say OpenMP, OpenMP target, or serial, this will compile and run and do exactly what you expect. If you switch to a different backend, like say CUDA, it won't. And this may not seem like that much of an issue because it's just a compiler error. But what can happen is you can develop for a long time on a backend where this is legal, and then only days, hours, weeks later, switch to a different backend, try to compile. And now things you haven't touched in a long time are breaking, and you have to go back and figure out what's wrong. And so just to show you what we can now provide, we can run this tool. And it's built into Clang Tidy. And we'll run Clang Tidy with our Cocos checks on our file. And we get this nice warning function foo oops was called in a lambda. And it was missing the Cocos x function annotation. And then we can show you the line and column where that function was declared. And so now it should be pretty easy for you to go fix it. So there's really three types of errors that we hope to be able to detect things that could become compiler errors, like the one we just talked about, things that could become runtime crashes, such as you accidentally capture the this pointer inside of a, inside of a Cocos context. And then finally, there are situations where what you do is legal from the compiler standpoint, will happily compile and then give you incorrect results at runtime. And that's sort of the scariest type of bug because you may not find it for quite some time where in this case, for example, you're supposed to capture this sum by reference so that the value is actually being updated instead of capturing it by value. So how can you get this tool? Well, you can go to this repo here, which is just a fork of the LLVM project where we implemented some checks in Clang Tidy. You then build LLVM, our LLVM, the same way you would build the regular LLVM. And then you would run it the same way you run Clang Tidy, except that you would enable our Cocos checks. And this will probably be a question. And unfortunately, the answer is yes, currently you do have to go build LLVM from source or our LLVM from source to get these because there is no plugin mechanism for Clang Tidy. So let's walk through how we actually can use this. Um, you can actually integrate it into CMake, which is really nice for things like adding checks during CI. So for example, inside your CMake, you can come down here and define CMake CXX clean tidy, provide a path to your executable, the checks you want to run, and then it will get invoked on all the targets that the CXX compiler gets invoked on. This is nice because you get all the warnings in a big CMake, part of your CMake build. I have added one other command here, export compile commands. And what that will do is generate a compile commands.json file that you can then use to run clang tidy on the command line or clang b in your source folder. So this is just a, exactly what it says. It's just a big list of all the, all the files you're gonna compile and the arguments that go to them. Because obviously the tool needs the arguments to the files to, to run the checks. Um, another example is the one we just saw, which is where we run Clang Tidy on the command line. 
And then finally, you can actually integrate this into your editor as part of ClangD. Where ClangD is a language server, which you can read about at this link here. But basically what this is, is something that lets your editor talk to another process that understands C++ and it sends back suggestions. So like in this case, we have a highlight on this line that foo oops was called in a lambda dot 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 because it's long. And the slide doesn't really do a great job capturing, capturing that. So I have prepared a video that we're gonna go through real quick to show all of this in action. So I need to Okay. Okay, can you now see the terminal? Yeah. Okay. All right, so in this case what um what we're doing here is we're looking at a a file that has an error for implicit this capture. So we have this structure called bad class. It has a member called foo. And then inside of a uh, Cocos Parallel 4, we use that foo, which will cause this lambda to capture the this pointer. And that this pointer will then get dereferenced to access foo. And if you're on a backend where you don't have access to the memory space that the class was defined in or allocated in, then you will get a, an error. And this is the case that we saw earlier where we have foo oops. And foo oops is called in a Cocos Lambda and in a Cocos function, both of which could potentially lead to compile time errors, depending on your configuration. So now that we know what the um, these code examples look like, we'll just go to a build directory and I'll show you how to use it with CMake. So we'll just clean up everything. Then we'll look at our setup. And for now, we'll build without CMake to show you that you indeed get a very clean looking build. Sorry, we'll build without Cling Tidy to show that you do get a very clean looking build. No warnings here, everything compiled on the OpenMP and serial backends. But we can go enable those Cling Tidy checks. And what we're going to see is we now get a wall of warnings. So we can go back to the source directory now because we also generated a compile commands.json file. So we can go back to the source directory and we can actually just run the command line tool, clang tidy, to get these errors in a more readable form. So it's not just one big wall from every file that we compiled. And we'll do this first for the ensure Cocos function. And you see that we have these nice errors, function foo oops called in Cocos, foo Cocos is missing Cocos X function annotation. And we also get the same warning for the Lambda. And the reason it's X is because there's other things besides just Cocos function. It could be Cocos inline function, Cocos force inline function. And then we see the same thing for the implicit this capture where we get a nice warning that we captured the class pointer. And uh, the thing that's highlighted up here now is just saying that that came from the compiler. We don't dump the macro definition. And then we also are able to give you the exact line and column that the, uh, the variable was used at. So this makes it easy to find. And in a longer, in a longer kernel, that could actually be tricky. It could be difficult to figure out which variable is actually triggering the, the implicit this capture. And then finally, I'll show you how you can use Clang D. So I use Vim usually. So I have this uh, plugin called nvim LSP, which is for the language server. And we come up here and we can point that language server to use our compiled version of Clang D with some other options. And then when we open these files inside of our editor, we actually see that we get warnings in the editor. So the warning, the same warnings that appeared from Clang Tidy, we can get them to appear in our editor while we're typing. 
And then here, when I was recording this video, I made a small mistake and opened the wrong file, but it doesn't take long to fix. Okay, now that we're looking at the ensure Cocos function, we see that all we have to do to fix this is add this annotation and our warnings all go away. We can remove the annotation, warnings come back, add the annotation, warnings go away. And I'm cycling through this a little bit to show you, it is actually very quick. One of the questions we get is, how long does this take? Like, I don't want to use this if it's going to take a very long time because compilers are slow. And at least you can see in this admittedly toy example, it's very quick. If your code takes a significantly long time to compile, it will be slower, but it's not that it's always going to be slow, for example. And I think that is the end of my video. So we can reshare. Okay, we're back on slides. Everyone yep. else can see the slides? Yep. Okay. So to um, just to summarize what we just saw, we also can list some checks that we have, checks that we're planning on, and then hopefully get some feedback from you. So the current checks that we have are this ensure Cocos function check, the one we demoed. This um, Cocos Lambda captures the implicit this. We also demoed in the video. Checks that we're planning on writing are the parallel reduce functor takes argument by reference. That's the, the runtime error that I showed you that would be, uh, you would get incorrect results, but it would still compile and run. We would like to enforce Cocos semantics inside nested parallel regions. So for example, if you were in a nested parallel four, you can write your lambdas with reference capture, but you have to be careful not to modify the variables from the, the outer scope. So we can attempt to enforce that. One thing we could do is ban specific types from being allocated or used inside Cocos context. For example, std vector. And then finally, while we force you to name your views, we don't necessarily force you to name your kernels, but we could write a check that would either force you to name your kernels or automatically name your kernels for you. So that might be useful. And then finally, if you have requests or suggestions or complaints, feel free to go make issues at our repo here. And just to prove that we sometimes do listen, the ensure Cocos function check exists because someone at a workshop requested it. So I think that's the end of my section. So let me unshare. Drew, we, uh, we had a quick question in the chat that might be interesting. Um, someone was asking um, if he wants to use Clang D or Clang Tidy, does he have to compile his code with Clang or can he still use GCC? Um, you don't have to compile your code with Clang. If you have incompatible flags, that can be an issue though. For example, if you have GCC specific compiler flags, you might get issues trying to use ClangD or ClangTidy. But it works as long as, um, it, sh it, it works in many cases. I don't know that it's guaranteed to work though, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of today's lectures uh, where we taught you about, you know, all the kind of cool things we are doing with our tools interface and generally with our tools project. Uh, we talked about, you know, uh, obviously the static analysis now lasts, but before that, we talked about the Cocos tools, uh, the instrumentation interface, Cocos P's, and the tools which leverage it. Uh, again, this interface is always available, even in your release builds uh, with zero overhead if you do not actually use a tool. And we talked about how you can load the tool just by setting Cocos profile library pointing at a shared library. Or if you want to integrate it tighter with your codes, you can actually set callbacks in your code. We talked about connector tools, which provide uh, information to third party like vendor and academic tools and which help you with readability of your profiles and which remove kind of the need for you know, vendor specific instrumentation in your codes. And then, you know, there's this growing list of tools which support Cocos natively. Uh, we'll talk a bit about Cocos tuning, which enable you, you know, more performance portability. 
essentially it hopefully it will avoid in the future for you to need to figure out the characteristics for every platform for like variables for your kernels. Uh, it uses input variables and output variables, you know, which describe the problem scope and the search space respectively. And when we talked about the implementing your, uh, how you implement your own tools, that you can simply implement the needed C callback functions and you only need to implement what you need, not, you know, all the interfaces. And that you can use the callback registration with that as well. Okay, that's it on tools today. Next week, we actually are going to hand off to the Cocos Kernels team, which will give you an introduction into uh, you know, what they have available as capabilities. So we will talk about dense linear algebra, we will talk about sparse linear algebra, uh, we'll talk about sparse solvers as well as graph kernels. And um, hopefully that will be good and we'll see you all back there. In the meantime, join our Slack channel. Uh, you can also drop into our office hours on Tuesdays. Uh, and, you know, the recording will be available soon and then hopefully see you soon. See you next week and see you on Slack. <laughs>